Welcome to Becoming Boss C. Today, we will learn about Domain 3 of the Certified Internal Auditor Exam, Part 1, which focuses on proficiency and due care. Here are the syllabus topics for Domain 3. A. Recognize the knowledge, skills, and competencies required to fulfill the responsibilities of the internal audit activity. B. Demonstrate the knowledge and competencies that an internal auditor needs to possess to perform his or her individual responsibilities, including technical skills and soft skills. C. Demonstrate due professional care. D. Demonstrate an individual internal auditor's competency through continuing professional development. And we are expected to know A at a basic level, while we should know B, C, and D at a proficient level. So that means that you should have a deeper, more detailed understanding of B, C, and D. Proficiency is the ability to apply knowledge to situations likely to be faced and to deal with them without extensive recourse to technical research and assistance. There is a direct relationship between a person's proficiency and competency. Having a high level of proficiency about a topic leads to that person being considered highly competent regarding that same topic. So proficiency is where you have a keen understanding of topics without having to do additional research or ask or inquire people about that topic. Competency or competence is the combination of knowledge, abilities, and skills obtained from education and experience necessary to conduct audit and consulting engagements. So what is education? Education is a systematic and systemic process aimed at developing your knowledge, skills, and abilities. So these are typically skills that are acquired in traditional academic environments, such as college or graduate school. Education can be obtained through either self-learning, self-teaching, or by attending classes where you are actually taught certain skills and knowledge. What is experience? In this context, we're referring to workplace activities that are relevant to developing your professional skills for internal auditors. So experiences such as audit director or audit staff or external auditing all contribute to your work experience as an internal auditor. You're learning through on the job training. So when someone asks you about your unique qualifications that you possess that will enhance the internal audit team or the organization, they are asking this to determine if you have the necessary skills and abilities to carry out or fulfill assigned work responsibilities and duties. Organizations goals are to have employees who possess core competencies so there will not be any competency gaps, skill gaps, or talent gaps. In other words, the audit department aims to have all needed knowledge, skills, and abilities by hiring skilled internal audit staff, managers, directors, and consultants. Audit managers should ask the two basic questions. Does my internal audit department have the competent employees that it needs? And number two, do my employees have numerous competencies and skills so they can conduct multiple job responsibilities and assign tasks? If managers can answer yes to both questions, then the department is doing a great job at hiring skilled auditors. Speaking of competency, there are four competency levels that are in play. The first level is entry level, then we have journeyman level, functional level, and expert level. So let's discuss these four competencies in detail. When you think of entry level, consider positions and roles such as staff auditors, audit trainees, and audit interns. These roles have a low competency level, so they have little work experience as internal auditors and do not have an extensive level of competence or proficiency regarding audit topics. Journeyman level includes roles such as senior auditors, lead auditors, and in-charge auditors. 
This level has additional responsibility compared to entry level, and they have a medium competency level. So while entry level has a low competency level, journeyman level, senior auditors, lead auditors, and in-charge auditors typically are responsible for training staff auditors and interns. Then above the journeyman level is the functional level. This includes audit supervisors and audit managers who are knowledgeable in the audit function and other business functions. They have a high competency level and they are generally governing the entry level and journeyman level. Then last, at the highest level of competency, we have the expert level. And there could be various types and classifications of experts. So you could have subject matter experts who are known for being highly knowledgeable about certain industry topics, or they could also be known for being a general expert who has a lot of knowledge about various topics or various subjects. So for example, I know that in grad school, we stuttered Michael Porter, who is from the Harvard Business School, and he's known as being a well-known subject matter expert in the area of corporate strategy. So that is an example of an expert that we would note. So those are the four competency levels, entryman level, journeyman level, functional level, and expert level. So to wrap up the competence lesson, think about competence as being able to make sound decisions and use professional judgment for situations that are highly subjective in nature. Now, let's discuss due professional care. Due professional care is exemplified when an internal auditor applies the care and skill expected of a reasonably prudent and competent person in the same or similar situation. For example, when internal auditors perform audits and consulting activities in accordance with the Institute of Internal Auditors standards, they exercise due professional care. This means they are independent of the activities they audit, internal audit work is effectively, effectively planned, effectively conducted, and appropriately supervised. This also means that internal audit reports are clear, concise, objective, and are distributed to management timely. Due professional care also involves having internal auditors who have the required knowledge, skills, abilities, and competence to perform the audit well and perform the audit in a, in a very professional manner. To compare proficiency and due professional care, we know that proficiency refers to education, experience, professional development, and acquiring professional certifications, such as becoming a certified internal auditor. Those all enhance auditors of overall competence. Due professional care refers to conducting audits with a systematic, structured, and disciplined approach, as required by the Institute of Internal Auditors International Professional Practices Framework and it also requires following the internal audit manual or charter that has been established by the organization or the internal audit department. Now, let's briefly discuss continuing professional development, or this may also be known as continuing professional education. And as you all may know, the certified internal auditor, uh, being a certified internal auditor requires you to obtain at least 40 hours of CPE each year and this is a requirement that has been established by the IIA. So to be competent, we know that includes being knowledgeable about specific audit requirements and having the skills and abilities to proficiently apply that knowledge on audit engagements. So CPE greatly contributes to auditors' competence. Determining which subjects are appropriate for, in for internal auditors to satisfy the CPE requirements is a matter of professional judgment that should be exercised by auditors and audit managers. In certain cases or certain states, you may be required to take ethic, ethics training or you may be required to do a general audit training each year. These can also be assigned by organizations or by specific internal audit departments or the auditors themselves can choose whichever areas they would like to study further. So CPE programs 
are structured educational activities with learning objectives designed to maintain or enhance the auditor's competence to address audit engagement objectives and perform work in accordance with those audit standards. So an example or examples of specific subjects that qualify for CPE may depend in part on the industry the auditors work in or work for and the audit profession as a whole. So as you could imagine, there may be certain skills that you need to know if you're in the manufacturing industry compared to being in the telecommunications industry. CPE should be tailored based on your industry so that you can apply those skills and knowledge to your specific job role. So you may attend conferences, conventions, meetings, seminars, or you may have internal training programs such as specific courses or workshops. You can also obtain a CPE in some parts by publishing articles and books that are relevant to the topics that you are studying or that you are working in. So internal audit management should perform knowledge gap assessments at least annually to evaluate whether their current staff members have the required knowledge, skills, and abilities that are commensurate with the organization's strategy and operations. So they can utilize management feedback surveys or internal quality assurance program findings and external quality assurance program findings to identify and assess any knowledge gaps. And knowledge gaps are those gaps where staff may not have the required knowledge or skills to perform their job duties. Next, we'll discuss professional judgment and how that relates to competence. So as you know, internal auditors must use their professional judgment when planning and conducting the audit engagement, and also when they report their final audit results. Professional judgment includes exercising reasonable care and professional skepticism. What is reasonable care? Reasonable care includes acting diligently in accordance with applicable professional standards and ethical principles. So what is professional skepticism? Well, attributes of professional skepticism, professional skepticism include a questioning mind and an awareness of conditions that may indicate possible misstatement owing to error or fraud. So professional skepticism in, involves us being very critical and looking at evidence with a questioning mind and a critical assessment. We are alert, we question management. In other words, we trust but verify. So auditors may accept records and documents as being genuine unless they have a reason to believe that those documents could be fraudulent or fictitious. A critical component of the audit engagement is that auditors use their professional knowledge, skills, and experiences in good faith and with integrity to diligently gather information and objectively evaluate the sufficiency and appropriateness of evidence. So let's discuss sufficiency and appropriateness. Sufficiency is basically, is there enough? Do we have enough evidence to conclude on this matter? Appropriateness is, is this evidence, is it relevant? Does it relate to what we are actually trying to judge or assess? In addition, professional judgment and competence are interrelated because judgments made depend on auditor's competence. So if there is a competent auditor, more than likely they will have good professional judgment. However, if there are incompetent auditors, they may have very poor judgment. So that is how professional judgment and competence relate. Professional judgment considers any threats to auditor's independence. If you go back to our previous lesson, we talked about how important it is for internal auditors to be independent. And then professional judgment also considers whether the audit team's collective experience, training, and skills are sufficient to assess risks that the engagement subject matter may contain. So proficiency and competence relate, and then professional judgment and competence also relate. Remember, Professional judgment does not mean eliminating all possible limitations or weaknesses associated with a specific audit engagement, but rather when you have professional judgment, 
you are able to identify, assess, and mitigate risks, and also conclude on how high or how low those risks are. Next, let's discuss competency levels for internal auditors. So internal auditors must possess the business-related knowledge, skills, and abilities required to perform their audit work, and they must meet professional responsibilities of the internal audit activity. These knowledge, skills, and abilities can be acquired or developed over time, and they are generally classified as having common skills, hard skills, and soft skills. So common skills are those skills from a variety of sources necessary to make an internal auditor more proficient and competent. Examples of common skills are business acumen, critical thinking, logical reasoning, communications, basic legal and ethical principles, audit and legal evidence, analytical and functional knowledge, and general assurance services and consulting services. In addition, industry knowledge can be also be common. Risk management knowledge can also be common. Also knowing how to sample for testing and knowing how to assess the statistical results is also common knowledge. Now, what are hard skills? Hard skills are those core skills and abilities that you learn and acquire in your profession in order to do your job. So hard skills require analytical and technical skills and functional skills. They may include problem solving, having to make decisions, and also manage the audit as well as apply audit strategies that are best for that specific audit. Examples of hard skills are dealing with specific rules, methods, tools, techniques, from job to job, regardless of the work environment. And hard skill can also be learned, acquired, and perfected over time. They are tangible and much easier to quantify. Also, hard skills help a person get the job done on time with resources provided. And hard skills complement soft skills. So examples of hard skills are those quantitative, analytical, and technical skills such as knowing how to assess probability theories, knowing basic mathematics, knowing how to perform certain analyses, such as factor analysis, cluster analysis, link analysis, benefit analysis, etc. Even cost and benefit analysis. I know that's a major, a major skill that organizations look for. Having those problem solving skills, decision making skills, managing skills, application skills, and functional skills, such as knowledge of accounting, finance, marketing operations, are all examples of hard skills. On the contrary, we have soft skills. So unlike hard skills, soft skills do not represent acquired knowledge, skills, and abilities. Instead, they represent the natural inherent skills or innate skills that you are born with such as common sense, the ability to deal with people and interact with them in a proper manner, the ability to get along with your audit team in difficult situations, and that also includes having a positive and flexible attitude. So because some soft skills such as interpersonal skills, people skills, and leadership skills are innate, they cannot always be learned or acquired through education, training, or development programs. Specifically, soft skills deal with a person's character traits and their interpersonal relationships. They are natural, innate, and instinctive. Examples of soft skills are interpersonal skills, people skills, communication skills, comprehension skills, even your presentation skills, how you present information to the key process owners or your audit clients or the board of directors or the audit committee. Time management skills are soft skills, as well as negotiation skills, motivation skills, your learning skills, how easily you understand information and comprehend, your critical thinking skills, 
and your reasoning skills, the way that you logically think or logically reason and deduce information that you are presented with. This also includes your collaborative skills, how well you work with your team, how well you can interact with other departments and the audit clients. So we've discussed common skills, hard skills, and soft skills. Hard skills represent what a person knows and soft skills represent who a person is because it it is innate and it is instinctive and natural to the person. So here I will provide an extensive list of hard skills and soft skills that you can reference, but note that communication skills are actually considered the number one or most valuable skills that internal auditors of all levels need. Think about it. Staff auditors have to communicate when they're writing their audit reports. They communicate when they're documenting their audit procedures and audit supervisors communicate when they are giving instructions to staff auditors. Audit supervisors also communicate with audit clients when they are discussing their audit findings and audit observations. The chief audit executive also communicates when he or she is presenting to the board of directors or the audit committee, or when they are communicating expectations of internal auditors in the internal audit charter. So as you can see, communication skills are highly coveted and very valuable as an internal auditor of any level. All right, now let's answer some practice questions. Number one, the relationship between competency and proficiency is A, indirect, B, direct, C, unrelated, or D, not observed. So we're looking for the relationship between competency and proficiency. Remember, proficiency is defined as having the ability to apply knowledge to situations likely to be faced and to deal with them without extensive recourse to technical research and assistance. There is a built-in and direct relationship between a person's proficiency and competency. One needs to be fully proficient first to become a fully competent person. Therefore, the relationship between competency and proficiency is direct. The answer is B. Number two, regarding competency levels, staff auditors belong to which of the following groups? So we're looking for the group that staff auditors belong to. And we discussed this earlier. Staff auditors have a low level of competency since they have little work experience in internal auditing and they most likely have little training on what internal auditors should do. So staff auditors belong to the entry level. The answer is C. Remember, the journeyman level is typically your in-charge auditors, your senior, senior auditors, and then your functional level are more so your audit supervisors, audit directors. They have the high level of competency. And then we have the expert level where we have the subject matter experts or just experts who have gr a great detail of knowledge about various topics. Number three. Which of the following is the highest ranked skill required at all levels of internal auditors? So we're looking for the highest ranked skill. A, technical skills, B, persuasion skills, C, communication skills, or D, report writing skills. So while all skills mentioned above are helpful and valuable to have as internal auditors, they are, there are certain skills that have a higher priority and are more desired. For example, staff auditors and internal audit managers may need to have a deep knowledge of technical audit strategies because they are performing their audit procedures. They are assessing risk and documenting identified observations in the audit report. However, the chief audit director generally has more administrative tasks and responsibilities, such as communicating with the board of directors and making presentations to the audit committee each quarter. So those chief audit 
executives do not have to have a high competency in technical skills. So A is incorrect. Persuasion skills are critical when working with audit clients and persuading them to remediate observations and issues that were identified by the internal audit engagement team. However, this is not the most valuable skill across all levels of internal auditors. So B is incorrect. While report writing is essential to share information and to share audit results, these chief audit executive and audit directors do not typically write audit reports. So they generally review the report or advise staff auditors and managers on how the report can be designed or improved, but they do not actually write the report. So D is also incorrect. The correct answer is C, communication skills. While you can argue that report writing skills are a piece of having communication skills, it is more specific. So report writing is more specific than the general communication skills. And therefore report writing is not the best answer choice for this question because communication skills include speaking, presenting, writing reports, communicating effectively with audit staff, communicating effectively to external employees and executives outside of the departments, such as your board of directors and key process owners. Audit staff should know how to communicate when writing reports and documenting audit procedures. Audit managers should know how to verbally instruct their staff, communicate issues to management, as well as give updates to the chief audit executive. The chief audit executive should be able to communicate with the audit department to communicate expectations, finalize the audit charter documentation, and communicate significant audit findings to the audit committee. So communication skills are the highest ranked skills for all levels of internal auditors. Whew, I know that was an extensive explanation, so I'll take a pause here. If you are still tuned in, like the video and subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. Also, you should now see a join button to become a channel member. So look below the video for the join button. And when you become a channel member, you will get exclusive benefits and get a very distinctive loyalty badge that shows when you comment and, partici and participate in live chats. All right, number four. Auditor's professional judgment does not mean a. Assessing all possible risks. B. Mitigating all possible risks. C. Identifying all possible risks. Or D. Eliminating all possible risks. So the key word here is not. We are looking for an example of what professional judgment is not showing. So as internal auditors, our job is to utilize our professional judgment to perform risk assessment procedures to find and mitigate and identify risks. These are all part of the standard risk assessment task that is performed year round for organizations. Auditors cannot possibly eliminate all possible risks because some risks are too difficult to get rid of and many risks will always be inherent as part of the company's culture or the nature of the organization's business. So the answer D is correct. Auditors' professional judgment cannot be used to eliminate all possible risks. Number five, regarding professional judgment, internal auditors cannot attain which of the following? A, absolute assurance, B, reasonable assurance, C, expected assurance, or D, possible assurance. So this is similar to number four. Auditors must use their professional judgment when planning and conducting audits, especially when they're reporting their audit results. Internal auditors can provide a reasonable assurance, expected assurance, and possible assurance that the operations are designed effectively, those controls are designed effectively, or operating effectively. However, internal auditors cannot provide absolute assurance. Why? Well, in order to provide absolute assurance, you would need to test 100% of the, of the population 
of all of the testing areas. So a sample testing approach would not provide absolute assurance. And even if you do test 100% of the population, something could still go wrong. So the answer is a absolute assurance. Number six, do professional care for internal auditors does not mean A, developing a structured approach to audits, B, attending audit-related professional seminars, C, adhering to a disciplined approach to audits, or D, developing a systematic approach to audits. The key word here is not. We're looking for a scenario where due professional care has not been applied. So due professional care is implemented when we think critically about audit evidence, when we apply a level of professional skepticism, when we follow professional standards outlined by the IIA and internal rules when auditing. So developing a structured approach to audits improves due professional care. So A is incorrect. Adhering to a disciplined approach to audits also improves due professional care. So C is incorrect. And developing a systematic approach to audits enhances auditors due professional care. So D is also incorrect. All three of these options provide a structure, a discipline, and a system for performing audit work, which is vital when auditors conduct their audits in a professional manner. Attending audit-related professional seminars may enhance internal auditors' knowledge, skills, and proficiency. However, it does not improve due professional care. So the answer is B, attending audit-related professional seminars. Our last question, number seven. Do professional care is not exercised when A, the internal audit work is planned, B, the internal audit work is supervised, C, internal auditors fail to follow up on repeated audit findings, or D, the internal audit reports are objective and clear. So we're looking for another example when due professional care is not being applied. So the key word here is not. We need to find the scenario where internal auditors do not exercise due professional care. We just define what due professional care is. We know it involves being a critical thinker. It involves following professional standards when we conduct our audits and consulting activities and effectively reporting audit findings and observations to key process owners and other relevant levels of management. Based on these definitions and examples of due professional care, the answer is C, internal auditors fail to follow up on repeated audit findings. As internal auditors, we are expected to follow up with management when an audit finding is discovered and has still not been remediated or corrected. If we do not follow up, we are not in compliance with the internal auditor's professional standards, and we are not exemplifying due professional care. So the answer is C. Whew. Well, those are all of our practice questions. Comment below and let me know how many questions you answered correctly. Remember, it is okay if you did not answer the questions perfectly because you are still learning and practicing. Be sure to like this video if you enjoyed the lesson and subscribe to Becoming Boss C if you have not already so you can be notified when new videos are published. Consider becoming a channel member by pressing the join button below so you can acquire exclusive membership benefits and support the channel. All right, keep studying and update me on your progress in the comments section. As always, stay blessed and stay Boss C.